Pastor Craig Groeschel, who's the lead pastor of the largest church in America, Life Church, over 60,000 people attending across literally dozens and dozens of campuses all over the country, shares the true story of his less than promising career as a pastor. And it should serve as a reminder to the power of perseverance in the midst of setbacks. He writes, he said, only weeks after putting my faith in Jesus, I tried to teach my first Bible study to a group of young guys in a little church in Ada, Oklahoma. He said, afterward, the leader of the youth group said, well, I guess teaching the Bible is not your gift, is it, Craig? <laughs> Three years later, he said, I finally got up to the nerve to try teaching the Bible again. After being uh, asked to preach my first sermon, after the service, I stood at the door and said goodbye to church members. An older gentleman <laughs> looked at me with a raised brow and remarked, nice try. <laughs> he said, the next lady in line asked if I had any <laughs> other skills besides being a preacher, and then made a weak attempt to encourage me to keep my options open. He said, seriously, this really happened. He said, I had to fight off the temptation to go and run and hide in the baptistry and never come back. He said, but despite another setback, still believing God's call, I continued my journey forward towards full-time vocational ministry by going to seminary after college and marriage. He said, halfway through seminary, the day finally came when I stood before a group of spiritual leaders as a candidate for ordination in our denominational church. He said, with the entire committee looking on, the spokesperson explained to me, we've chosen not to ordain you. You don't have the gift mix we see in most pastors. In fact, we're not even sure you're called to be a pastor. But feel free to try again next year. But for now, it's a no. And I can imagine 70,000 People later, Craig Groeschel looks back at those people in a very spirit-filled way and says, <laughs> right? Talk about the, the need for perseverance in the midst of setbacks. And so here's a, a great question to wrestle with as we finally wrap up this series in the book of Acts we've been in for several months. And the question to wrestle with is this. What would it take to make you quit joining Jesus in the mission? And I'm convinced the most impactful people in the kingdom are not the most gifted people, it's the most committed people. Turn with me to Acts chapter 27 as our starting point in looking at the final two chapters in the book of Acts in this series. And if you think that perseverance is not essential for the journey, let me run through a laundry list in the book of Acts of all the times in the book of Acts we've seen where there were opportunities to jump ship and to abandon the mission of following Jesus. In chapter 4, Peter and John were threatened and told to stop talking about Jesus. In chapter 7, a disciple named Stephen was stoned to death for spreading the gospel. In chapter 8, Saul was ravaging the church and persecuting those who loved Jesus. In chapter 9, Saul's converted, but because of his testimony for Jesus, the Jews sought to put him to death. Chapter 12, James, the brother of John, is killed by Herod because he belonged to the church. In chapter 14, Paul was nearly stoned to death. In chapter 15, a sharp disagreement arose between Paul and Barnabas that called them to separate. Chapter 16, Paul gets thrown into prison. If you recall, God uses that moment to save a Philippian jailer. And all throughout the rest of the book of Acts, Paul speaks before trials in councils, in synagogues, in a variety of uh, cities and the scripture records this kind of summary statement that everywhere he went they reviled him they hurled insults at him and sought to take his life last week we saw Paul testify about the resurrection of Christ in front of a governor and a king with no regard to his own life and all the glory to God alone there are so many places all throughout the book of Acts where the movement could have been derailed but it never was and it never will be in Here's why. Job chapter 42 reminds us, no purpose of yours, God, can be thwarted. Amen? No purpose of God can be thwarted. And here's the purpose of God in the book of Acts in our life today. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the very first week we looked at this, said this, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so there's no question that's the mission 
There's no question the mission of God will not be derailed. And so this morning as we come to the end of our series of the book of Acts, there's only two questions that remain. Number one, what would it take to make you quit? And number two, are you participating or are you watching? By this point in the book of Acts, Paul has proven his commitment to Jesus. Uh, Listen, he's just about seen it all. He's endured it all, stonings, beatings, shipwrecks, snake bites, fill in the blank, everything else. And so, so listen, if I were writing the story, I'd have a little compassion on Paul, right? Like I'd get to the end here, the last two chapters, and I'd say, you know what? This guy's had enough. Let's give him some rest and some relaxation. Let's let him have a happy ending, right? That's not at all what happens, though. And so let's pick it up, the beginning of the first two chapters, by looking at Acts chapter 27, uh, verses 13 through 26 this morning. Verse 13 starts off, it says, Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was called and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. And after hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. And since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Listen to this verse 20, this is an important verse. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest... Lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they'd been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and have not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night stood before me an angel of of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship, and he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but it's not the end you want. We must run aground on some island. Hey, listen, here's the good news, guys. We're going to get off this boat, and guess where it's going to land? At the crash site, right? That's where we're landing at. And so this morning, I want to help you understand and embrace the mindset of a person who's fully devoted to the mission of Christ and will not quit. And they make that decision on the front end because here's why. In the middle of a storm, that's the worst place to ask yourself, how committed am I? Am I really all in? You should make that decision on the front end. And so what's the mindset of a person who makes that decision on the front end? The first thing we see in these two chapters we're going to look at today is simply this. Don't forget where you came from. You ever had anybody tell you this, and most of the time when they tell you this, by the way, it's not a compliment. You've forgotten where you've come from. Uh, If you grew up in certain parts of the country that you may say something like this, you've gotten above your raisin. Anybody ever heard anything like that, right? A couple hillbillies in the room, amen? And so uh, what they're saying is, hey, you've forgotten your roots, or maybe someone's had tremendous success and they've, they've forgotten their humble beginnings. And when that happens... Uh, We forget. We forget all that God has done for us, all the things that God has led us through, all the times he's sustained us. And when that happens, it can lead to arrogance. It can lead to complacency. It can lead to uh, inactivity. And so over and over, there's a word that we see in the Bible, and it's the word remember. We see God's people setting up memorials and singing songs about deliverance. Why? So they don't forget the, the activity of God in their life and the character of God on display uh, in their life. And so one of the main reasons that people like you and I get off mission, one of the main reasons that we just kind of coast and drift in an activity, one of the reasons that people abandon joining Jesus in the mission is because we've often forgotten where we've came from. We've lost sight of how incredible it is that God reached down and took a dead person like us and raised us to new life in Jesus Christ. And when you forget the incredible miracle of a changed life, guess what? You experience mission drift. 
Acts chapter 27, look at verse 20. Verse 20 says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay upon us, listen to this phrasing, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. You know what that's a picture of? That's a picture of you and I before we met Jesus Christ. In total spiritual darkness, the waves of sin and life in a fallen world crashing around us, no hope of saving ourselves, no spiritual light, hopeless and totally helpless. Not only could we not save ourselves, we couldn't even improve our condition spiritually. Now, if we're not careful, sometimes we can dwell on our past and all the things that God rescued us from and all the times God sustained us from uh, in a period of what is morbid introspection. And so we certainly don't want to be guilty of that. But, but here's, there should be times in your life where one of the things you're regularly remembering and meditating on is that one time you were just like the person on this ship, tossed to and fro in utter darkness, and all hope of being saved was at last abandoned. Now, here's why. If you're listening, say amen. Sometimes the most motivating thing to keep us persevering into the future with Jesus is a deep gratitude for our salvation in the past. When we reflect on our hopeless and helpless condition, those dead and trespasses and sins, it is a tangible reminder about the power of the grace of God. And if God can bring a dead person to life, then God can sustain me in this storm. So I'm just going to keep on keeping on for Jesus Christ, no matter what happens. And if we remember that God saved us when a really bad storm hits, it sustains us in the present and in the future. When we think about the men on this Ship, 276 men. We read other places here at the end of the book of Acts. Some of them were soldiers. Some of them were prisoners. Some of them were bound. Some of them were free. But you know what united them at that point? They all needed saving. Social status didn't matter at that point. Age didn't matter. The, listen, the storm didn't care who was on board. The ocean was ready to swallow up anyone who fell out of the ship. Not a single person on board deserved to be saved. It was a long shot, but by the grace of God, every single one of them were saved. And that's a picture of you and I. Let me make this as plain as I can. You and I should never come to the place where we're no longer amazed that God rescued us from sin and death and hell. Now listen, when I look around the room this morning, I can tell some of you have been saved a really long time ago, amen? Right? You know what one of my favorite testimonies to hear as a pastor? It never gets old. It's when a senior adult who's been walking with the Lord for decades and decades and decades, possibly even on the ark with Noah. <laughs> I went to eat a restaurant one time, there's... I told our staff, I came back, and there's all these older people around there, and, and I said, hey, there's like, I said, a lot of older folks there. He said, how old? I said, well, do you know these people? They were the oldest people in our church at that time. I said, I think I was sitting next to their grandparents. That's how old the people were in there. And yet these people who have known the Lord, literally, some of them longer than I've been alive, every chance they get with incredible joy, they'll just tell anyone who will listen, I'm so thankful that so many years ago, Jesus Christ saved me from sin and death and hell. And the longer you're saved, the easier it is to forget what it's like to be lost. We're just like the men on the ship, helpless and hopeless, and yet God rescues us. And so one of the things to keep us moving ahead is to remember where we came from, is to remember that, listen, no matter what's going on, no matter what's going to happen or what's in front of me, when I look behind me, God did the incredible, God did the miraculous, and God's grace was enough to raise this sinner to new life in Jesus Christ, and that same Saving grace is also available in empowering grace. And so I'm going to keep moving ahead in faith that Jesus is going to sustain me. Because if I ever question that, I just look back and remember, he saved me. We've forgotten sometimes. We don't join the movement. We've forgotten how desperate we were for deliverance. And how incredible it feels to be rescued. You know who the best evangelists are in every church? New Christians. You know why? Two reasons. Number one, they're overwhelmed at the feeling of being rescued. 
that they're just so excited, they'll tell anyone. And number two, uh, they're ignorant. And what I mean by that, no one has told them you're supposed to be afraid to tell other people about Jesus, right? <laughs> they don't know any better. They don't know it's supposed to be awkward. They don't know you're supposed to be afraid. They just say, hey, I got rescued. It's incredible. And they want to tell everyone why. Because they tangibly remember where they came from. And can I just tell you this, and we're going to move on, that if you have gotten over getting saved, you're on danger to abandoning the mission of rescuing other people with Jesus. Every man on this boat needed rescued. All of them were reminded of their condition. All of them had abandoned all hope of being saved. And so when you feel like not moving forward and persevering, look backward. The second mindset of a person fully devoted to the mission, not going to quit, is this, is that all credit goes to Jesus. If we could put ourselves in this boat for just a moment, as the storm's raging, the ship is being tossed around, the passengers are desperate to survive and they start throwing cargo overboard the ship's tackle overboard can you imagine they're fearing their lives in the midst of this panic <laughs> Paul stands up to speak as only Paul you know what I've learned about Paul in 28 chapters in the book of Acts Paul never missed an opportunity to speak up did he not once and listen to what he says to them chapter 27 look at verses 21 and 22 this is fantastic here's what he says remember they're panicked. They hadn't seen any light, moon, or sunlight for days. Remember what the end of verse 20 said? All hope of being saved have been abandoned. Right? So that's the scene that Paul's getting ready to get up and share a word of testimony. Here's what Paul says. Men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Amen. Like, who doesn't love and I told you so in the midst of a crisis? How helpful is that, right? But then here's what Paul says. Yet now I urge you to take heart. For there will be, now remember this, verse 20, they lost all hope of being saved. Remember that? What did he say? For there will be no loss of life among you, only the ship. Paul goes on to say that he'd encountered an angel of the Lord that last night and it spoke to him telling him that all of them would be saved and his faith is rock solid. I'm sure that for some of the men they thought this guy's crazy but, but for many of them they were probably deeply encouraged. Now let me ask you a question when you think about this scenario. As we think about the efforts of this men to secure the boat and throw things overboard, as we think about Paul and his faith in God and the confidence he spoke with, as we think about Luke and some of Paul's other companions in this scene. Here's a question to wrestle with in this passage. Who is the hero? And I'd encourage you to ask that question a lot in your life. Who, who's the hero? Who most often gets the glory in your life? And I want to make an analogy to help us see why all the glory and all credit at all times should be given to Jesus Christ. And I want you to listen closely. The hero in Acts chapter 27 is the ship. The ship is an analogy of Jesus. The ship is where they sought refuge in the storm. And their efforts to save themselves, you know what that's a picture of? It's a perfect picture of humanity. From the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, when man fell, what they say? They didn't say, oh, let's run to God in refuge. No, they said, let's hide, let's Put together some uh, fruit of the looms, right? We'll clothe ourselves and we'll fix what's broken. We'll save ourselves. It's a picture of humanity. They're doing all they can to spare their own life. Jumping ship was not an option. Why? Because the ocean was there to swallow them up. The only thing they could do is to trust in Paul's words that this ship, though tossed about and battered, would eventually lead them to safety. And so they shouldn't take refuge in their efforts. They shouldn't have confidence in Paul. They should take refuge in that the ship will get them to where they need to be safely. And that's a picture of our lives as well and of the life and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And oh, how much different would our lives be if we believed that to the point where we actually lived out of it on our worst days? 
There's a verse in Romans chapter 6, I think it's verse 11, where it talks about your faith. It talks about reckoning it so. What does that mean? It means I believe it to the point I'm actually living out of those convictions. And the answer is not found when, when your life gets dark and there's no hope of being saved and throwing the cargo of your life overboard. I'm going to get rid of this and I'm going to do this and, and I'm going to go on vacation or I'm going to earn some more money. I'm going to get a different job. The answer is not found in gritting our teeth and holding on our own strength. The answer is not found in operating out of emotions. Listen, the only answer, the only escape is to seek refuge in the promise of the ship, which is Jesus. Let me make this as plain as possible. If you don't run to Jesus for refuge and strength, you won't have the strength to weather the storms of life. No one is smart enough or strong enough to navigate life in a world cursed by sin. Now, if you're here and you like practical Bible teaching, would you just raise your hand? You got the rest of your sleep, that's encouraging. I want you to listen closely. It is the routine spiritual disciplines that you use to pursue intimacy with Jesus every day, prayer, fasting, Bible study, service, sol solitude, worship, all those things. It's those routine spiritual disciplines that you use to pursue intimacy with Jesus every day that prepare you to draw strength from him on your worst days. Let me repeat that. It was a good place for an amen. You missed it, all right? It is the routine spiritual disciplines that you use to pursue intimacy with Jesus every day that prepare you to draw strength from him on your worst days. You see, when you're in the habit of running to him daily, it'll be easier to rest in him when you want to jump ship. And please hear me this morning, not only is Jesus the one who'll carry you to safety in the midst of the storms, he runs his life into the ground so that we can be saved. Look at verses 39 and 41. Down in verse 44. Here's what it says. It says, now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay at beach. So remember this? Remember they, they, there was no light. They couldn't see anything, verse 20 says. And so now the, the sun's come up and they can see again. They know what's out in front of them. Hope has been restored. They didn't recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with the beach on which they had planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore, <laughs> crash landing. Verse 40 says, so they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. At the same time, loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable. Listen to this. And the stern was being broken up by the surf. And so it was that all who were brought safely to land. Do you see the picture here? That the ship is not only their place of refuge, the ship is not only where they have their confidence in that they're going to get to the other side, but the ship sacrifices itself and is broken apart for saving other people. That is a picture of Jesus. That's where the confidence comes to persevere. Listen, if you've got any confidence in yourself and you're going to grit your teeth and try hard and those kinds of things, I don't have any confidence. You know why? Because I know me too well. I know how many times I've failed. I know how many times I've flaked out. You and I can persevere, not because we're able, but because he is able on our behalf. When we are weak, the Bible says he is strong. And so the only hope that I have is to seek refuge in Jesus. All the credit for saving me and sustaining me and getting me to the other side and the shore safely at the own expense of himself is Jesus Christ. We persevere not because we're able, but because he is. And so you've got to have that mindset in the front of me because if you think that when life gets hard, I'm just going to grit my teeth and hear me this morning. Life just hasn't gotten hard enough for you yet. And so all the credit goes to Jesus. All the strength is from Jesus. All the sustaining grace is from Jesus. All the saving grace is from Jesus. All the perfecting grace is from Jesus. All of my confidence is in him. 
And here's the third mindset of a person committed to Jesus in the movement. Third mindset is this. is seize on every opportunity to make a disciple. You know why some people quit following Jesus? If you're here this morning and, and you know people that used to serve and were faithful and those things, they don't darken the door of a church anywhere. If you know anyone like this morning, would you just raise your hand? Like I literally in 20 years of ministry, I know thousands of people like that. And there are all kinds of reasons. You know, I, people say, so, well, I used to go to church, pastor, but, but I had a bad experience at church, so I don't go anymore. You know what? I've had a bad experience at a restaurant. I haven't given up eating out. Amen? Like, I'm very committed to that. Very committed. What's going to happen after church? I'm going to ask Tasha, where do you get? I don't know. How about here? I don't want to go there. What about here? I don't like that place. Where do you go? Wherever you want to go. How about here? I hate that place, right? That's going to happen. You know what is going to happen, though? I'm going to persevere. We're going to eat. Praise God. <laughs> Tasha is spirit filled. We're going to eat at Skyline. Amen. And so sometimes people have been hurt by the church. And listen, I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. Listen, people at church can break your heart. They're not any more sinful, but you expect better out of them. But one of the reasons people abandon ship is because their journey with Jesus, it was exciting when they got saved. I mean, wow. This is what I was like before I knew Christ. This is where I was headed. This is what Christ has done for me. He ran his own life into the ground for, to rescue me. I can seek refuge. They're overwhelmed. But the longer they serve Jesus, the less exciting it becomes. And it's just another sermon. It's just another church service. And I've sang this song a hundred times. And, and here's what I'm getting at. There's no more excitement in there. They're no longer living as missionaries, excited about what opportunities the day holds. You know what's exciting? When God uses you in the life of someone else. And so Paul... Here, here he is at the end, like if, like if anybody should say, hey, you've done enough. This week I read something fascinating. Uh, I've never watched the Oscars, but apparently something exciting happened at the Oscars this week. I don't know if you guys are aware of that or not. So I read a little commentary, and one of the great spiritual prophets of our day, Jim Carrey, said this, who is a, just a fountain of wisdom normally. Uh, he did say something fascinating. He said he's retiring from acting, and, and here's what he said. He said, uh, you're, you're not going to hear many famous people say this. He said, but I really mean this. Here's what he said. He said, I've done enough, and I have enough. I'm good. If anybody could say, hey, I've sacrificed enough. I've done enough. Somebody down there dropped their beard. Did you guys hear that? In church. <laughs> I'm not being judgmental, I'm just saying it's early. That's all I'm saying, all right? It's early. I like to wait till after church before I come. No. Somebody's a guest, got a cup, holding it tight. Don't, don't, right? Hey, if there's anybody who, like, we look at Paul's life. Listen, he's near death. This is about 62 AD. He's near 60 years old. I mean, the guy's just sacrificed everything. If there's anybody who say, hey, you deserve to, after that shipwreck and that crash landing, you deserve to coast on in. You've done enough. Listen, at the judgment seat of Christ, who wants to be behind Paul, right? <laughs> What'd you do? Well, I just snake bite and I led this guy to Christ and I got stoned to death and I'm back there like, oh, I, ooh, Right? But Paul, all the way to the end, was living an exciting, anticipating missionary journey, always seizing and waiting to make a disciple for Jesus Christ. Paul Tripp, one of my favorite authors, said there are two great gaps in the Christian life. He said one is the grace gap. He's where we understand that grace is good for forgiving our past and grace is good for getting us a home in heaven in the future, but we're not, we're not totally sure how grace works in the present. So he said there's a grace gap, and he said there's a second gap, though, and it's what he calls the ministry gap. And the ministry gap is where we reduce ministry down to formalized appointments that are scheduled. 
And so when someone asks us, do we do ministry, we would say, yes, I'm on the schedule to work in the nursery. I serve as a small group leader. I'm a greeter twice a month. Fill in the blank, whatever the schedule is. He said, but in reality, ministry is not a scheduled formality. Life is ministry. The everyday, ordinary life that you're living is filled with daily opportunities to represent Jesus well and to make disciples for the glory of God. You don't have to wait for an outreach event to be coordinated by the church. You don't have to wait for a mission trip is scheduled. You can wake up every single day and say, hey, I'm alive. And so what that means is I'm on mission for Jesus Christ. And when you live that way, listen, there are no ordinary days. There are no ordinary encounters. Seize on every opportunity to make a disciple. And guess what? You'll never run out of exciting adventures with Jesus. You'll never want to abandon the mission. Why? Because it's so exciting that God doesn't need you, but he would use you. And so Paul, here at the end of his life, in chapter 28, this is how the book of Acts ends. Paul's in prison in Rome. No one take a guess what he does? Acts chapter 28, verse 30 and 31 says this. He lived there two whole years at his own expense. I got questions about that when I get to heaven. <laughs> With prison, you paying your own bills and buying your own food, what does that mean? Listen to this. Now, it could have been bitter after all I've given, after all I've sat, after all I've endured. This is how the story is going to play out for me. Listen to what it says. Verse 31, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, listen to this, and without hindrance. One track mind. What does it look like to live every day on mission for Jesus Christ? Living out his final days near the end of his life, just a couple years from his death. Can we all agree that what we've learned in these last several months of the book of Acts, Paul would have been an old 60, right? You ever see that person that, it's a picture of someone, they're all crazy looking like, right, strung out, just worn out. You know, and they say, hey, teaching or school or some other kind of hard job like that has been nothing but joy. I look great for 25 years old and they look like they're 80, Right? That's Paul. And here he is. It doesn't matter the time of day. It doesn't matter if his audience is Jews or Gentiles. It doesn't matter if he's in church, a jail cell, on a boat. It doesn't matter if they receive his message or like they most often did, reject his message. Over and over and over, Paul just every single day, he said, hey, I'm I'm in the greatest adventure of my life. And why in the world would I abandon that? And some of you are in your Christian life, and you're just, let's be honest, you're bored. You've been doing this a long time. Several years ago, I was at a conference on parenting, and the speaker said something I'll never forget. He said, parents, how many of you are freaked out that your kids are going to abandon the faith and go chasing after idols and all kinds of other things? Of course, every you know, parent in the room raised their hand, and he said, let me just give you some advice. He said, make sure that your kids see your journey with Jesus as an actual exciting story worth pursuing, because if they don't, they'll go looking for a more exciting story. And so what does it look like to live like this? You wake up every day purposely and intentionally engage in a missionary mindset you view every encounter with your kids and your spouse and your coworkers and your neighbors and your classmates and even strangers as an opportunity to make a disciple because disciple making is not scheduled, it is life. And when you have that mindset and a huge obstacle comes up, instead of being crushed by it, you know what will happen? If you really live out of this truth, if you reckon it so, you know what will happen? 
Your frame of mind will not be, what happened? Did God get me out of here? And what did I do to serve? Your frame of mind will be this. I wonder how God is going to use me in this unexpected part of the journey. I didn't want cancer, but Lord, I'm, I'm a little excited about how you're going to use this journey in my life to impact other people. I never wanted a wayward child But God, what a testimony you've given me of your sustaining grace in my life to minister to other people. I've never lost a job and all the security. I've never lost all my wealth and resources and security in a pandemic before. What an opportunity, Lord, that I now have to share with other people that our security really is in a sovereign God who loves us and gives us good gifts. Lord, I never planned for this part of the journey, but I'm excited to see how you might use me, Lord. And you can choose spiritual anticipation instead of anxiety in those moments. And live with a renewed purpose that drives you and refuse and reject spiritual passivity. You see, some of you have not been on an adventure with Jesus in a long time. you just come to church every week. Listen, hear me this morning, church. Don't waste your life invested. And the only two things that are going to last for all of eternity, according to the word of God, is the word of God and people. That's it. That's all that will stand in the final day. And so if you pour the greatest passions and energies of your life into other things, nothing wrong with enjoying them. But if they get your greatest passions and heart affections, guess what? You've wasted your life, invest your life, and wake up every day and say, Lord, I don't know what today holds, but I know who holds me. And I believe, God, this You're going to put me in some divine appointments, and I want to represent you well. How exciting is it to live every day as a mission trip? And if you'll do that, guess what? You'll never abandon the journey. You'll be like Paul. Prison? Perfect. Captive audience. Right? And seize every opportunity to be a disciple maker. So the book ends with Paul preaching the kingdom of God without boldness and the Bible says without hindrance. The picture of perseverance. Listen, not because he was strong, but because Jesus was. Life's going to be hard. Listen, we live in a fallen world and Satan's a real active enemy. Let me remind you, I've read the back of the book. We win. Don't be defeated by daily battles because the war has already been won. Don't abandon the, listen, don't abandon the mission. Why? You're on the winning team. Seek intimacy with Jesus every day so that he's the natural source of refuge on your worst days. Be excited by the fact that God has allowed you and I the privilege of joining him in the most exciting, incredible, important work in all the world. You know what? There's a 29th chapter of the book of Acts. Did you know that? Like my Bible doesn't say that. Use the wrong Bible. That's why, right? You know the 29 chapters in the book of Acts? It's you and I. It's you and I. Keeping the mission going forward. Wow. How incredible is that? Who in the world would abandon that for some cheap temporal life? And so let me close this series with a word of encouragement in this message with the counsel of Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Here's what it says. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest, listen, if, conditional, if we do not give up. Would you bow your heads this morning? Your head bowed this morning. I have two questions. Number one, have you sought refuge for your sins in Jesus Christ? The Bible says that he ran his life aground. He was crushed by sin's cross. He was our sacrificial ship. There's no question about that. The question is, 
Have you received Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Have you sought refuge in him from sin and death and hell? If the answer is no or I don't know, listen, I can't think of a better day than today to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so if you've never done that or you're unsure you've done would you just pray right in your seat? You can be saved right where you're sitting this morning. There's nothing in the Bible says you have to walk to the front of the church to be saved. Right where you're sitting this morning, would you pray right now and confess your sins before a holy God? You say, Lord, I, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. When I compare my life to the life of Jesus Christ, I fall short, I'm a sinner. And Lord, I believe and confess that that sin has separated me from God. And I also believe that Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross, his payment for my sins, was buried and rose the third day. And I believe that anyone who ever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so Lord Jesus, I'm calling on you today to save me from my sins. Would you do that right now? Here's the second thing I want to do. This is a little different this morning. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're here and you're persevering the best you can, but quite frankly, you're tired and discouraged and there are some days that you feel like giving up. Just this honest before God. If that describes you this morning, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, without any shame, would you just right where you're at, would you just stand to your feet, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, would you just stand up if that's you? Right now, just stand up. Say, I'm weary, I'm discouraged. It's been a hard to persevere in some days. Amen, amen. Anybody else, would you just stand up? If you just sent someone around you, stand up. Would you just quietly inside, would you just go over and would you just put your hand on them? Anybody around you, stand up, just put your hand on There's people standing up all over. Would you do that? Just as a tangible way to remind them, you're not alone. People here in my right section, some people stand with them if you would. standing alone. Let me pray for us. And these people standing beside you are a tangible reminder that God has put people in the boat with you. Can we pray today for everybody who's standing and everybody who should be standing today? Father, help us not to believe the lies of the enemy who tell us when we're struggling that no one's ever struggled like this. Help us not to believe the lies that tell us that no one cares and we're all alone. God, the tangible people around us are a reminder that your grace is made tangible through the people in the body of Christ. And so God, we're so grateful that no one has to stand alone in the worst storms. God, we're so grateful that Jesus is the boat we can take refuge in. And God, we're so humbled that he sacrificed his own life for ours. So God, may we stand in the days ahead. God, for those who are standing and weary, I pray that your grace would be tangible this week, that they would remind their own hearts that if you raise them from the dead, you'll get them through this storm. And so God, we celebrate your grace. We're humbled by it and we're dependent on it. And so we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just celebrate the Lord together this morning? Can we do that?